We're very lucky this afternoon to have Mark Fang once again as our speaker. Mark will address Westchester County's recently passed source of income legislation. In terms of background, we have a brief overview. Mark is the executive director of the Westchester County Human Rights Commission. He was appointed to that position in May of 2012 by County Executive Rob Astorino. A practicing attorney for 19 years, Mark has served as an assistant attorney general in the criminal division of the New York State Attorney General's office. He has also served as an assistant district attorney in the Westchester County District Attorney's Office, the first Asian American to be appointed to that position in the county. The Westchester County Human Rights Commission works to eliminate discrimination and promote equality by advocacy, educational programs, and when necessary, legal measures. The county's human rights law prohibits discrimination based on a wide variety of reasons. They include race, color, religion, ethnic background, creed, age, gender, sexual orientation or disability. Those areas, of course, will be covered by Mark in his presentation. Mark is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Tufts University. He received his law degree from the Georgetown University Law Center. He has been in the private practice of law since 2000, where he has concentrated on litigation in both criminal and civic matters. He is a former board member of the Westchester chapter of the Organization of Chinese Americans. Mark is originally from Yorktown Heights and is a graduate of Yorktown High School. Please join me in welcoming Mark Fang. Okay. Well, thanks for having me again. I was here um, maybe seven months ago. Yeah, about that. We're talking about. Um, but uh, I want to thank uh, my ex-colleague Carl Finger for uh, arranging this for me. We were colleagues in the DA's office a while back. Uh, today we're going to get right into the law, the um, uh, new source of income law, source of income legislation, which became effective uh, in December uh, 2013. So it just became effective. It was enacted, uh, passed by the Board of Legislators, had a, you know, a whole history that you probably know that Jeff was involved in and uh, Al was involved in with the Board of Legislators and the County Executive and uh, lo and behold, that to it, to it. Lo and behold, uh, we have our law. Uh, the law does expire in five years, so as I'm telling a lot of different groups, you know, we should be taking notes about it and seeing what works, what doesn't work, so that five years from now, if um, uh, you know, it comes up before the board again for, uh, for deliberation in terms of renewal, uh, we, we can have some input um, and, and uh, constructive input on what's, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. For, um, for the law moving forward, if, if, if in fact it, it gets renewed. But we can be part of that process, and we should, you know, five years is gonna go by real quick. So we're, we're not, there's not that many jurisdictions that have a law like this. So I've been looking at local uh, enforcement of local law 10 in, uh, in New York City, just to kind of guide me to some of the issues that may come up and how the courts have handled them. I can tell you some of those cases, um, maybe in the question and answer period, and um, well, I'll, I'll tell you about some of the uh, some of the uh, scenarios that come up. Um, I'll run first. I'll run through the law. Just some of the basic provisions. That won't take too long. Maybe I'll go go over some of the uh, issues that come up or that I've seen uh, in the course of other cases in the city with local law 10, uh, and then we can do some question and answer. I have a copy of the law if you wanna, um, I'll pass it out, I don't have a, I don't know, 50 copies. Uh, just start in, a, in the second section. But the first sec, the first page, I don't know, I don't know why we included that, but it's the, uh, just the legislators that voted for it, didn't vote for it, if you may find that interesting. Okay. So you can follow along with what I'm going to do. I just go through the law um, section by section. There's not that many sections. Basically, though, what has happened here is, uh, you know, in Jeff's introduction, 
We, um, we handle discrimination cases uh, with the traditional group of uh, group, group identities and it's kind of an expansive list here in the county, but you know the usual ones, race, religion, sexual, uh, sexual orientation, gender, uh, ethnicity, national origin, uh, creed, uh, disability, of course, is a big one. And now, um, so with this new law, just so you can think of it conceptually, we've added source of income. So source of income is a protected category in the, within the fair housing law. Um, and then there's some exceptions. So I'll um, go, over the, go over that now. Everybody get a copy? Here and there, every table. Okay, so um, just starting here, you'll see section three, source of income. Uh, not just section eight. Section eight was the primary purpose of the law, and you'll see in the, uh, the preamble and the legislative history that that was really the impetus for the, the law with HUD um, uh, really kind of putting a gun to our head to make sure that we have the law. So uh, section eight, but it could also be any other uh, federal, state, uh, governmental voucher or non-governmental. So it could be something from you know WRO or Mount Vernon tenants. Let's say they had a grant to uh, give to their their clients for housing. You'd have to accept that too. So it's a it's not just Section Eight. That's the point uh, that needs to be made. There it could be a grant or a loan program from a private housing assistance organization. Section. 3V1, just moving down again. Uh, so that's kind of like the, this is probably the provision that maybe Jeff and uh, uh, Al probably ha helped to, to work, make sure got into the law. And this is, make sure you get the basic protection for, traditional protection for screening out um, prospective tenants. So you'll just note there, uh, I'll read it since, uh, if, you, if you have it, you don't have it. For the purposes of this article, as they relate to unlawful discriminatory real estate practices on the basis of source of income, it shall not be, shall not be considered discriminatory if differentiations or decisions are based solely upon factually supportable objective differences in the level of the individual's income. Uh, so that gives you, right? So, the key word there is level, right? Level of income versus source of income. Right? If you're, you, you'll never be, um, you'll never have a problem, run into a problem with this law if you're genuinely uh, looking at the level of income. Okay, that's uh, what what that's saying. And then just looking, reading down, uh, the level of income of the individual's income, which is defined as, as the sum total of all sources of lawful and verifiable income, uh, income, including but not limited to the sources of income defined herein. Dif differentiation or decisions based on the level of income must bear a reasonable relationship to the individual's ability to meet his or her personal housing payment obligations that arise from the tenancy, ownership, or occupancy, etc. So, you know, that's kind of like a litigation pressure point right there, right? Reasonable, does it bear, does the rationale you gave, does it bear a reasonable relationship to the individual's ability to meet his or her personal business payment? Your lawyer will say it does, of course, and then uh, you know, the other side will argue that it's not reasonable. Okay, uh, moving forward, this is an important part, section two, on the following page. You're allowed to, your, uh, you and your clients are allowed to uh, inquire about uh, what their source of income is. So they may make a written or oral inquiry concerning the level of source of income. So that's express provision in the law. They're allowed to do that. Um, this one, this next section are the exceptions. And um, it's very important to remember the fair housing law exceptions, the original fair housing law exceptions. So you have, for instance, the Murphy's, Mrs. Murphy exception with the four or less home and the owners in there. 
right? That's accepted from our law. Or you could own three single family. You're allowed to have three single family. This came up and I was talking to Wuhan Lawrence, you know, about whether or not that would be, if you, so you have three single family, uh, up to three, as in investment properties, you're not living there. And, but that's an exception in the law, okay? A regional exception. So the original exceptions apply. You have to look at those or have your lawyer look at those too. They're kind of grafted on um, to, the, uh, to the exceptions here, this paragraph, which is if you're looking following along the uh, parenthetical three, V3. So <clears throat> this is one that gets confusing. So 700.21c, that's in the original fair housing law. We can talk about that, or you can, you can schedule a meeting, and I'll, we'll go over those with, uh, uh, if, you, if you have any questions about those, or I, can, I can walk you through those. A little bit confusing. But here's the new exceptions here. Uh, D, you're accepted from the law for housing accommodations <clears throat> other than publicly assisted housing accommodations for six or fewer families living independently of each other, provided that the person owns or has ownership interest in only one such housing accommodation. <clears throat> so that's a little bit confusing. So six or fewer. So if you have a six unit, <clears throat> six family unit uh, building, that's exempted. You don't have to live there. That's exempted from the law. If you have <clears throat> two of those, then you're in the law. You fall in the law. We can go over that in the question and answer session, but uh, it gets a little bit confusing. Because then you also have to graft on the, um, like I said, the original fair housing exceptions. Remember, so if it's, if it's four or, I know, confusing everybody, did this yesterday. Uh, if you're four or less, a four unit house, that's the Mrs. Murphy exception. So that might not be counted in this six person total of uh, units of six or less. We can talk about that, but that's, that's one of the exceptions. So you need, to, you need to think about the exceptions, right? See if it, the law actually applies to you. But that's one of the ones that you need to look at. You know, if it's a 20 person unit, then 20 family unit, then you know, you're not, you know, you know that the law is going to apply to you. Uh, the next section four, <clears throat> and this is the you know the Lewandowski um, kind of rationale. It's put it it's expressly put into the law. This is probably what you guys helped to work on to make sure that it was in, in the law, and that's just to make sure that you all, that you that this doesn't does not upset the reasonable business judgment rationale, uh, the normal reasonable business judgment rationale for. Uh, accepting or rejecting a, a, a prospective tenant. So that's, they make that express. W, uh, section W, at the bottom of the page, it applies to all sale, rental, lease, sublease, just the whole gamut of transactions. Um, we're almost stuck. So then the, you'll see uh, the second to last page, section six, the, um, <coughs> The different um, uh, damage, the damage structure, the fines that can be leveled, and <clears throat> it can be very severe if, for you know, very purposeful, devious, willful, wanton, malicious behavior. And I'll just say that um, you know the law is brand new, uh, and we know that. It's not, uh, this is some, it's not an in, intuitive law, you know, like a, uh, an assault or something, you know, that uh, you would know that this is a bad thing. There's a lot, you know, for my presentations like this, a lot of, a lot of landlords have very good rationale for, historically, for not taking Section 8. Um, but now this is the law. So I guess my point is that you know, we're going to, we understand that the law is new, um, that it may be something that a lot of land, uh, landlords and owners uh, don't, don't understand and need to become accustomed to uh, over time, and that's how we see the law. 
in our when we look at the the enforcement picture on, on a case by case basis. So um, if we do see you know obvious uh, attempts to uh, get around the law, or uh, as I saw in one case um, relating to a, a city case, you know disingenuous. Um, uh, arguments to support your uh, support your uh, rationale for re rejecting a section eight. That's one category of of a kind of case that we would look very uh, take very seriously and look very hard at. Uh, if it's another case where you know this is brand new law and you know um, this is just have been your business practice, but now you have been unaware of the law and uh, uh, you had come across a section eight. Applicant and uh, un, you know, unbeknownst, without knowledge of the law, we, we had determined that that was really the case, and that's another category of case. So I, I just want you to be um, very certain that we're going to be very uh, uh, reasonable in the enforcement of the law, as we are reasonable in in enforcing any uh, all of the provisions of the fair housing law and the uh, human rights law. And then that's it. The, um, you'll see in C the sunset provision. The local law shall expire. Shall expire. So it automatically expires uh, and be deemed repealed five years after the effective date of, sub of subdivision B of this section. So I don't know what happens after five years if you know, someone, some legislator brings it up. I guess it'll probably come up three years from now or something. And then this whole process of um, getting a renewal will, will take place. But by then, you know, hopefully we have some experience with it. You know, I was just talking to these guys back there about um, <clears throat> dealing with CBR, which is the administrator. And that, that sounds like a good idea just to get kind of a knowledge um, of the Section 8 process. I can just tell you from some of the cases I saw, uh, courts haven't looked at that that, um, you know, I, I, uh, the excuse of, a uh, couple, couple landlords tried to use the excuse of, you know, I, my, my place wouldn't qualify anyway. You know, it didn't have the right sink or something like that. And court said that's, they weren't sympathetic to that. They said, you know, that's not your decision. That's this, through the, based on the process uh, set forth in the federal regulation. That's, that's the administrator's decision, not me, the uh, C, it would be in our case CVR. So that's an interesting category of cases to, um, to look at. Uh, that, that's actually it, right? If you have it in front of you, that's, that's the whole law. And um, I know you have some questions probably, uh, you know, we, there might be some hypotheticals and those are very difficult for me to go over because eventually, you know, I'll have to, uh, make some decisions on individual cases, and I hate to be locked in, but, uh, you know, back then you, you had said that you would come out like this on this kind of situation, but um, I guess I'm open to questions. Sorry. Oh, that's fine. Oh. Okay, I, I want to get clear the, uh, the issue of the uh, level of income. Mm -hmm. And for the left side, like the second name case, what do you ask Working and section eight. So that's an interesting distinction you make, right? So You know, I wouldn't give you enough uh, uh, thumbs up or thumbs down today, just in this presentation, uh, just because you know, I don't want to, you know, I'm going to get cases, um, going to get live cases, so I don't want to be locked into anything. But I'll, what, I'll, what, I'll, what, I'll, what I will tell you is, you know, what you're articulating now is a rationale other than just the person's source of income, just based on what you just said to me. And 
you know, it seems like that's possible that that may very well fit into one of the reasonable business judgment rationales. Oh yeah, uh, that's okay. Well, I'm three hours, right? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in the case of where, uh, so, uh, was it a local law ten? Yeah. That would uh, give us some guidance in terms of how far to use this in general. Because yeah. those of us have been landlords for a long time, when it's a question, you bring them in, you start talking until you get a feel for them and then make a decision. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, you don't put a number on that. How, how is that going to be in front of them? Like gut feeling? Or? Yeah, that's right. In other words, it's, it's my gut that ultimately decides whether you rent it to this person or not. And you get in front of the Human Rights Commission, yeah. and they'll say, you know, how do we, I, I don't know what criteria you can use. I know, I mean, I guess uh, I would have to look at and see what the other factors are in tandem with your gut feeling, and also see what what the other side has to say about that, you know, what they what they may, how, how they may be able to shed light on what your real gut feeling is. And I guess that's the way, that's the kind of case that would be, you know, maybe a fact finder would have to, 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 uh, to determine. Well, if it's just, if you just said, well, I think I gave you guidance on the first, on the first situation you said. Yeah. If you, if you listen to what I said, right? Yeah, because you said you had source of income yeah. and also, uh, what was the other thing? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's a, to me, that is sounding along the lines of a reasonable business judgment. Right. When you, when you, when, when you, now you ratchet it up a little bit and you say, you know, gut feeling in any, in, in any uh, fact scenario where we see gut feeling, whether it be like an employment case or a public accommodation, you know, a case where the person, you know, had the owner of a store had a gut feeling about the person and stopped him at the to see what was in his bag. You know, gut feeling doesn't. We probably have to sift through the gut feeling. Well, if you have contemporary, in any law setting, right, that if you have contemporaneous documents that you can present uh, when, you know, something hits the fan, right, it has a lot of weight. And when, when, the, when the investigative agency is reviewing what actually occurred, right? So, what if somebody calls our office mm -hmm. and gets turned off, said, we, you know, we, we were discriminated against, that was it. They didn't do a lot of application, didn't do anything. And a year later, they come in and, uh, and uh, accuse us of discriminatory practice under this thing. You know, how are we going to handle that? Maybe you have, have We have a documentary telephone call, somebody that is looking for a harm. Well, you know, the, the, the person coming forward with a complaint has to have some, you know, they has to, has to have some articulable basis for making a complaint. Right? We're not going to take every complaint, so if they just made a call and said, and we're rejected, then that's going to be in the factual mix, too. And that's not, maybe won't have as much weight as if you, you know, walked, uh, walked through the application with the process through the, per you know, for several weeks and then they were rejected all of a sudden. So uh, I, I think that this doesn't change, this shouldn't change how you run your business in terms of what, you know, what your document retention policy is or whether formal or in informal. Uh, you, you know, you will, these cases could always come up even if uh, there was no source of income law, right? You could get challenged for, for a racial issue or um, ethnicity. So this doesn't change 
how you're going to do your business practice in any, in any dramatic way. It's going to change your document retention policy? Yeah, social practices as opposed to questions. Yeah, no, I think it will change a lot of things like that. But how you run your business and what your policy, your internal policy is in terms of keeping records of things, I don't think this is going to be any, any uh, more strenuous other than you now you have another category that you have to look out for. Well, one year for us, meaning, words, let's say it happened within one year. Yeah, within one year of the event. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anything else? I, I have a okay. question. Okay. Please, I want to ask Carl Finger. Carl, you can go. Jeff, just jump on the phone. Can you just walk people through the process in brief? The process, um, like a complaint comes into your office. I think that would give you some context to some of the questions that are being asked. Mm -hmm. So that. People understand, you know, how that works. Yeah. So, uh, and this is kind of new procedure that we've put for uh, put forth. But so the process for us is the person walks in the door, or they call, they email uh, with their complaint. And we won't file a complaint immediately. They have to really cross a threshold, so a low threshold, de minimis, as they say it in the law. Uh, but they have to have set forth something. can't just be, I was discriminated against. So, uh, if they're able to make an art, if they're able to articulate a prima facie case of discrimination, whether that's employment, housing, or any of the other categories, then that's enough to file a complaint uh, with the Human Rights Commission. We then allow, this is new, we allow it, we'll inform the owner that we have enough to file a complaint. The person we believe is made, has set forth a prima facie, is able to articulate. Doesn't mean it's, you know, the case is decided. It's able to articulate a prima facie case of discrimination, housing discrimination in this case. We then allow a 20 day window, this is our new, uh, our new procedure, 20 day window for the two sides to see if they can work it out, negotiate some kind of uh, settlement pre-complaint, before we receive a complaint. We'll get involved in that, but hopefully these guys can, if they can work it out, sometimes these cases can just work out with the pressure of a pending complaint before them. If they can't work it out, then we'll file a complaint with the commission and then the investigation will proceed uh, like a normal investigation for any other case, and then we will try and make a determination of probable, we have to make a determination of probable cause or no probable cause. Uh, if we determine that there is probable cause of a violation of our law, then uh, the case the case will go to a, an administrative law judge for a fact finding, like a trial, mini, mini trial. And then, um, and then the ALJ, we have four ALJs, actually you're, you're one, Carl's one of them, um, who will, uh, administrative law judge. So they're like judges, but they're administrative judges. It's like hearing officers, you know, a DMV or something. So uh, then they'll decide, they'll hear witnesses, they'll look at documents if you have them, and, and then make a decision. Uh, and then they'll come out with a decision. They'll also determine what the what they believe are the damages and the applicable fines, if anything. Sometimes it'll be fines. Sometimes they may be uh, equitable relief. So that's how the case plays out. And then there's an appeal process. Ultimately, the case could go to the uh, the second department, the Supreme Court Appellate Division, second department. So you need, you want to also be guided by their law. When I say that. The, I looked at some local law, uh, some cases in New York City, you just keep in mind that those cases are always going to be more uh, pro-complainant because of the, what was called the Restoration Act. The, the New York City law, just as an aside, I'll tell you, is, is much more uh, vigorously enforced uh, than the, um, or vigorously interpreted. 
than other laws in the state. Okay. Jess Hillman, you're up. Thank you. Uh, quick question. I know this law is because I'm good for five years. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious about statute of limitations on this. In other words, it's a four years down the road, so if you decide to go back three or four years, is there any statute? Well, for us, you have to come, and this is in the mainline law, the mainline fair housing law, the human rights law. It's a one year statute of limitations. So if it occurred five years ago, uh, too late. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't change. Yeah, that doesn't change. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Ken Baker. Uh, Mark, you mentioned just how equitable, possible equitable relief uh, after a hearing. What type of equitable relief would the commission have this deal, uh, jurisdiction to impose and enforce? Well, uh, by a simple one, maybe the person uh, you may, uh, we may ask the person to be uh, reconsidered his application or, or that his application be, tenancy be, be accepted, something like that, right? Or there could be uh, like training requirements uh, that we've, we've imposed in, in different cases here and there yearly training requirements on the fair housing law. Alan Singer. Yeah, I, I'm a little concerned about how one can force a landlord to do business in HUD. Which is, as we all know, one of the most unreasonable one of the agencies that ever existed. Uh, and you're forced to accept HUD fees, you're forced to accept uh, HUD's determination whether you can terminate the tenancy and have to be subject to their regulations and to their inspections. And has there been any case that said that, you, that, that there is an ability, a constitutional ability, to force a landlord to do business with an agency you don't want to do business with? Yeah, I, I, I think there has been. I, you know, I'm not a HUD defender here, and uh, you know, I just enforced the law. But, I think there has been, I think that bridge has been crossed. It was an interesting 1998 Second Circuit case that dealt with this that made it seem to me like uh, that this might not be constitutional, but I guess that I was wrong, because we're here, right? We have the law. <laughs> it's all citizens it's in other, other parts of the state. I think Nassau has it. Nassau has this. So it, I, I, I definitely understand what you're saying. Um, yeah, to me, it's you have to accept HUD's money. It's yeah. to say you have to be subject to all their regulations. Yeah. I think mechanically, there will be issues that come out about how this is enforced uh, and how it's interpreted against people along the lines of what you're saying. Mechanically, we'll start to see that. And, you know, in a few short years, those issues should be you know, brought to the attention of the legislature when they think about uh, renew, renewing law or, you know, um, revamping it. Our friend from Cape Island. I'm sorry. Oh, that's right, that's yeah. Go ahead. One of the conflicts that Long Island has had with, with their source of income protection rules has been the fact that Section 8 and numerous other government programs require the approval of the property, you know, for the program which can take months at a time before you get that. So the question becomes, if I've got two tenants, one that's able to occupy today, and one that I have to wait until I get through the approval process and program, is it within my reasonable, yeah, like, excuse yeah, me, yeah. my reasonable judgment exception to say, I'm going to take the guy who's paying cash because he can start today and I don't have to wait two months for a hundred percent. Right. Is that within my reasonable business judgment under this law? You know, I, I like that one, but I, I'd have to, I'd have to, I don't know what my instinct is, I guess, along the, along the lines of your instinct, but I have to look at the way the courts have interpreted that, that kind of thing. I don't think they've handled it yet in Nassau. Yeah. So, yeah, they had a problem. Nassau had a problem with this. That's why they're not, um, as Barry, Barry knows this, because he was involved in the, uh, um, the Human Rights Commission, the chairman of the Human Rights Commission, when uh, the Fair Housing Law got passed. They actually, Nassau, 
because, I think it might have been because of the source of income, but they, they are not a partner with HUD like we are uh, because of some issues like that. They rejected it. Uh, so they do have a Human Rights Commission and Fair Housing Law and all that stuff, but they said it would because of some kind of problems with the law like that. So yeah, I don't have to look at the way the courts interpret, but I mean, it, you know, some of the biggest problems we as an industry yeah. have aren't necessarily with the tenants or where they're getting their money from. Yeah. They are with the governmental process, which is so yeah. burdensome as, you know, we're not discriminating against the tenant or where their money comes from, we're discriminating against a governmental program which is really putting a burden on the landlord. Yeah, no, the, only, the only strain uh, of cases I saw along those lines, as like I said before, I, I, I briefly said before, are the ones where the defendant said, um, they said, no, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't pass muster in the Section 8 process anyway. They did their own judgment. Well, they made their so own that's a little different. Yeah. And the court wasn't sympathetic to that. They said, you know, don't you don't make those decisions. The administrator does. Now, in our case, CBR, in the cases I read, was NYCHA. So that got smacked down. But yours is different. Yeah. Yours is different. Yeah. Could, could, a, could a landlord, for instance, say, yeah, I'll accept this time. It's going to be on my lease time. And no, I'm not going to go to the trouble of recertifying, and that's your business. And if you don't like it, then it doesn't get this apartment. You mean reject the um, Section 8? Um, yeah, reject the Section 8. It's not going to do it. Yeah, but then the person can't pay, right? And I has to come up with a different, different method. Yeah, see, I, I guess that would be kind of, that one might run you into some trouble. I don't know. I'm not here to make judgments. Right, because ultimately you're right, you're kind of rejecting the law. And we'll be civil dis a civil day. Civil disputes. My friend Johnny and then I'm gonna go ahead and form all the couple of more recent code into the process than the application review used to your business judge. It's not accepted status. How should we close that app? Should we notify them of the, the, the prospective tenant in writing that we aren't going to entertain our application for an XYZ? Should we email? Should we call? What constitutes a good procedure to kind of tie up that blue set, I guess? For Section 8 or anything, right? There. I guess in general, just again, we're going to treat everybody the same right now. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not an expert in that kind of landlord management question, management uh, question, but I mean, you, you would know better than me, Carl, but I, these guys are, you know, there's a lot of tenants who throw, you know, who are, um, they know their rights and they're ready to, ready to jump. So it seems to me anything you want to do to protect, to make sure that something creeps up, like you're saying, down the line, nine months, 11 months down the line, and you've got something something to show, right? Because there's there's some viable claims, real claims, and there's some all the way down through the spectrum to frivolous. And if you can show something, records, contemporaneous records that can put that to rest, you know, I, that's always, weight, always has a lot of weight in any legal category, in any legal kind of case, right? I don't know. I think that opens doors too. You know, then what are you going to notify them of? But you know, a lot of times if they if they're, I don't know. It's different ways to look at this. Sometimes when you notify them, then they feel like they've they've been um, uh, treated with you know respectfully, and then they they were able to handle it. Sometimes that just starts the process for them. You know, then they start to wonder what had happened. It, it initiates something. I don't, I, I don't know what the best practice is. It's probably no right? And these guys know. If you have something in writing, then you can rely on that later. So right, right. 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 I never yeah, I, 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 I forgot to say the major uh, 
major exception in the law, which is it does it doesn't apply to co-ops and condoms. So um, that's yeah. But I meant with regard to whether or not. Yeah, but I just want to make sure I say it. Is that's a major exception? If it's a co-op or a condo, it's not including the law. <laughs> Right, right. 40% yeah. credit rate. Right, right. Credit. Let's say 600, yeah, well, the credit is, that's, to me, that's purely level of income and right of business judgment. That's squarely. I can't see how that. Actually, I was in a tenants association meeting yesterday, and they, 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 they said they had problems with that. But, um, and then the other thing. The level of the source, the the ratio that also to me looks like uh, a purely business judgment. Well, that would run afoul of the state law. I think that might. I don't know if that applies. Yeah, at least for employment, they have. We don't have that in our law, but huh? So you can have a criminal record. There's protections for people with criminal records. Not in our law. has it, we have it, it's, Nassau has it, right? Nassau has it. No, no, I think they could. So in other words, they, they couldn't go to the, uh, no, they couldn't go to the state, but they could go to the court. They could go to a New York State Supreme Court, and they'll interpret our law. Yeah. 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 Yeah, if they have federal, if there's some basis for them to be in federal court, maybe there's like a, a, a HUD, a, a FHA, Fair, Federal Fair Housing Act, that might be one of the causes of action, and then another cause of action could be this one. Yeah, so look, you could go to, you could go to here, you could go to, um, you could go to state supreme court directly, or you could go to uh, uh, you could go to, if you can get into federal court, you can go to federal court. Yes, sir. Um, let's oh. say at a certain level, um, income level, credit credit score level, that decide now I want to increase that level across the board. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, that somebody now challenged. Like, like increase the ratio or they increase what? Yeah. The, oh, what the level? Yeah. Well, like, you know, 500% yeah. credit level, 600 now increase to 70, whatever. Yeah. 
And I want to do that across the board. And I, I've never done it before, but I start to go forward. I would do I would do your office. I, and if you have a rationale for doing that, uh, a business rationale, reasonable judgment, then I think that that passes muster. You know, if you're if, if we got this email, uh, smoking gun email that said, you know, oh, I'm going to increase the uh, credit score because uh, we did a study and um, that'll eliminate most source of income. Um, you see what I'm saying? Yes. Then you're. Yeah, uh, then I, I can't I'm ignore that. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know why? Um, they'll make that allegation. You know what I mean? The, someone will, you know, the, anything that you can conceive will eventually, if you get the the right, you know, complain it, it it'll it'll come to the fore. Would it make sense? If, let's say I and I want to change policy. Yeah. And I changed. I send it to your office. Would you would you accept the policy statement and showing that you're now? So this way, later on, if somebody came and claimed it, you would have a record that showed what we did at end time. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, you know, there's some kind of debate about whether or not we could do something like that. I mean, look, I, my, my uh, coming into the job, one of the things that they, you know, uh, the county executive, uh, Rob Astorino, and, uh, you know, his staff wanted me to be very, uh, wanted to be clear with me is that, you know, we're not here to overburden uh, employment, employers, business owners, uh, builders, landlords, you know, if there's a violation of the law and there's discrimination, we're going to really enforce our laws. That's what they're there for, and we have a duty to enforce the laws. But we're, not gonna, we're not here to, you know, entrap people or, uh, you know, make cases. So we're going to be fair. So if you have something like that, you know, maybe, maybe we'll, you know, take a look at it. Yeah, that might be, might, might be good. You know, good, uh, good, good way to uh, have a kind of a, a relationship, right, with the different entities. Because you know that will, uh, you know, it's better to be clear, right? That way, you know, I think it might be, might be a better way, and people know it's good for you to know the, you know, the law and be certain of your obligations. Under the law. So. We have time for two more questions. Paul no. Milne first. Uh, do you anticipate going forward that your agency will provide a better, clear guidance on reasonable business judgment, or absent that, unreasonable business judgment? I mean, this kind of ties into what you're interested You know, I could give a. <laughs> We have a seminar on that if you want with Carl on, and, and I'll, what I would be doing is reviewing the cases, maybe some of the cases that we handled and what the outcomes were, and maybe some of the second department cases, in, interpreting reasonable business judgment. Um, I could do something like that and tell you what the courts have said is reasonable, is reasonable business judgment. Where are you going to from the decisions that the courts show? You can get them online, or you can go, uh, if you put in reasonable business judgment, I have Westlaw, but if you went to like uh, Google Scholar, you could you put in reasonable business judgment, you put in New York courts, you'll see uh, like a whole bunch of cases will come up. And they'll say, you know, it was, reasonable, it was a reasonable business judgment for the person to consider credit and uh, have a ratio of this, that, and other thing. And then they'll have, so they'll articulate for you what the, what the different standard uh, factual uh, predicates have been in different cases and how the courts have interpreted it. Go ahead, hey, sir. Yeah, the, uh, I, I was honestly trying to take an interview. You know, the one thing you said about the level of income, the 40% you know, rent to income ratio scenario. I know there's a case in New York City that came out of that and said that it wasn't allowed basically because and it's the same language we have in it that says the differentiations on level of income must bear a reasonable relationship to the individual's ability to meet their personal housing payment. So it can't be level of income, is what the court had said. It has to be their ability to pay the amount due. So what we have to do is compare, literally, if you've got one person who doesn't have any kind of voucher or government aid, 
their ability to pay the full rent, as compared to the other person's ability to pay the remainder of the rent after the voucher. And that's what you have to look at. So if, if that's that, the case, oh. you can't just use a flat 40%. You have to use a percentage of what's left of the rent after the assistance program. Which, of course, raises the next issue. How long is that? I've had the same thing just mentioned in Google. Like that. Who was that, that in New York City? And, and this is Who was that, New York City case? Or New York City case. State Supreme Court? Or? Bronx. Oh, Bronx Supreme 2010. I think I might have that. Yeah, it's a little bit local. You know? Who was it, 2010, like recent? Yeah, it's recent. I think I might have that, yeah. Um, so my, my, my thought on that was, this is what I was looking at you, was how do we, you know, I, mean, that's, you know, I don't know if that's fine. It would guide us. It might not be binding us. Well, that's fine. That's why I mean, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Or is that East 187? You have different wording. It's slightly different yeah. wording than they have. And so that's what I was kind of looking to find out was, you know, how do we, and is there a way that you can set up, I think it'd be a great idea to set up like the DOE, like the Department of State does, where you can issue like advisory opinions that would give us direction of what is reasonable business judgment and what is unreasonable. Because right now we're kind of sitting in a quandary going, and I know you are too, in many ways, going, huh? That'd be interesting. I, could, I, I would be willing to do it. We're not just using the federal guidelines. Yes, to work. I think I have that case here. Is that East 1, 8, East 1, 8, 187 I Street? Remember, I, I did this when I first started reading this thing. Yeah, it's a 2009 case. case. It's actually in landlord tenant court. Interesting. <laughs> So actually, you could go to landlord tenant court with this, right? And enforce our law. The city court. Like Yonkers City Court can enforce our law. I don't know. Excuse me. Like a DSS voucher for housing or something? Yeah, well, well first of all, DS, if that was the case, I, I guess, uh, oh, no, no, the case, we'd have a case against you. We can't have a case against DSS, though. No, no. Because they're a county saying, entity. In terms of, yeah. I'm rejecting the, the, the client saying, you know, they're, they're only going to, he says, okay, DSS is going to pay my rent, how long? Yeah. yeah. So there's a limitation on it, not like Section 8, it's not an ongoing uh, commitment to the contract between me and the Government. So you're saying it's not a source of income. It's the lack of income on the source of income. It's right. Right. And so the question is, if I reject them because of that, could I right. be brought up and charged on this? I don't know. That's, that's, that's one of the that best ones I've had. That, that situation. Yeah. You can't because it's just it's the same scenario as if I had a job and I get hundred thousand dollars a year today, and I made an application and you you rent to the apartment. <coughs> Because I have that income today, but in three months from now I got paid off. Well, it's the same scenario. Well, here's, here, let, let's, say let's, say let's, say let's say you said that. Let's say you said that. Let's say you said that the person came forward with us, to us, right? We have to look at it. We may not. We know, we're going to determine if we can file a complaint. But then, in the course of our investigation or preliminary investigation, we uncovered that you did that again. To a person, um, or or you, you did that to you, you didn't do that to someone who had that same problem uh, for some other source. Or, you know, you understand what I'm saying? In other words, you weren't consistent with that. That might show that you were really discriminating against the Section Eight guy. Consistently decide not to accept someone with limitation, like a one-year limitation on the assistance. As long as not consistent, then that would hold a lot of weight. 
That's a that's right in, right along the the, yeah. the crevice. But as I say, it's it's one of those things that does happen here in Westchester. Yeah. So it's, uh, I think it's something we need to guide. Yeah, this is it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't know what more we would go over. Um, you know, I can't, uh, I can't give you. You know, there's certain things that are clear that I could give you my opinion on. I think, but other than going over the law, which we did, I, I could give another talk on different how different courts have handled this kind of thing. But other than that, uh, well, I could do that. I could do that. Yeah, I mean, you know, we could we could do it. Maybe I'll I'll give a survey of uh, how of different issues that have come up and how the courts have interpreted. You know, what I can't do is I can't get locked into so certain. Yeah. But I could do that. Yeah. Yeah. So I I, I could I could go over set something up like that. Because um, that's what's going to guide me. You know the. The case law. I know in such situations, you may have an apartment as the rent is going to be higher than the second name. And somebody has to establish an apartment, and we say, well, chances are second name is not going to, they're not going to prove that amount of the rent because it is the Yeah. And, and so we don't want to pursue it because it's a waste of time. Yeah, from the cases that I, I've seen, that was like parallel to the kind of case I was talking about just a few minutes ago. Like, you, I'm not so sure that's your. I think at the end of the day, a court might say that that wasn't your call. The administrator has to say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's nothing in here, you know. There's nothing in here that says, you know, if a Section Eight person comes, you know, presents himself, he's qualified. All activities to rent out this apartment are state. You know what I'm saying? In other words, that's just not what it says. So I. Yeah. Now let's say, yeah. Now let's say factually it came out that you were, uh, you know, a little magical email came down that said, uh, you know, I'm going to delay the process with CVR uh, because I got another guy coming in. I don't want Section Eight. A smoking gun like that. Then we have. That's something that we need to look at. At least look at. Okay, two more questions. How we wrap up? Mike Bell died, and then we have to wrap up. So, okay. I know this is a little bit backwards, so forgive me, but if I'm a Section 8 voucher recipient, and I get, let's say, $1,000 a month towards my rent, and I get a letter from the Department of Revenue and say, you know what, we're going to take that money and we're going to pay you the rent, and then we're going to pay you the rent, and then we're going to pay you the rent, and then we're going to pay you the rent, and then we're going to pay you the rent, I don't do ta tax, I don't do... But if I get a measure for $1,000 a month towards rent, am I declaring that as income when I file taxes at the end of the year, and am I actually paying taxes on it? Because then, I'm just wondering, I, I know it's backwards, so forgive me for, yeah. for being late to the question, but is that actually income? Oh, it's definitely not my expertise, man. Bad tax. We'll see in tax law. <laughs> Mike, did you have a question, Michael? No? All right, anyone else? Everyone, please uh, help me in thanking Mark Fennig. Thank you. And also, if anybody stands to consult the figure of 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 the figure of
February 4th and February 13th. You'll get many more reminders from us. Thank you. Have a great day.